Hello, everyone. I'm Jamie Goodrich, the director of the Humanities Center. And today it's my absolute pleasure to introduce this talk by Emily Spoonagle. Did I, spell, did I pronounce that right, Emily? I always worry I'm going to get it wrong. Spinagle, yes. Spinagle, great. Um, Emily is a PhD candidate in English at Wayne State, studying book history and British women writers of the long 18th century. And she holds a Master of Science in Library Science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a Master in English from Loyola, Chicago. Loyola, Chicago. She is currently Assistant Professor, Humanities and Rare Books Librarian at Oakland University's Kresge Library. Spinagle's work appears in the papers of the Bibliographical Society of America, Romantic Circles, Libraries, Colon, Culture, History, and Society, and elsewhere. She also serves as Chair of the Library History Roundtable of the American Library Association and Associate Editor for Sharp News, the review's publication for the Society of the History of Authorship, Reading, and Publishing. With Dr. Megan Pizer, who's also in the audience today, she directs the Marguerite Hicks Project, which investigates the provenance of the first inter in intentional collections in America of British women writers of the 17th through 19th century held at Oakland University. And if anyone's ever been to a brown bag before um, run by my predecessor, you know that uh, Dr. Edwards would have very lengthy uh, introductions and I can't match that, but I will say that I've really been looking forward to this talk that I happen to be on Emily's um, dissertation committee and she's writing one of the finest dissertations I've seen in a long time. So I think we will be in for a treat today. So I, with that, I will let Emily take it away. Well, thank you, Jamie. Thanks to the Humanities Center at Wayne State. And thanks also to my colleagues at Oakland, uh, roommates from my undergrad, um, uh, colleagues from different institutions that I'm uh, currently co-editing a book with. Uh, so this is this is a treasure to see uh, to see everybody uh, here. And uh, I've warned Jamie that this is not my dissertation defense and to not grill me with difficult questions. So let's see if we can hold her to that. Before I get started today, I want to drop in the chat. Um, let's see, links to my shared slides in case it's easier for you to follow along at your own pace and also an accessibility script for the talk so you can make it as big as you need to um, if you need help understanding my accent or um, if the font is a little challenging. All right, so without further ado, let me share my screen. And if somebody can give me a thumbs up that you can see my screen. Great, thank you. And I'm going to start with a quote. If the sole object of the editor had been to relieve pecuniary distress by bringing forward one instance more, in addition to many others, of considerable talents developed under circumstances the most unfavorable, many of the pieces which now form a part of the present selection would not have been obtruded upon the public. So Catherine Capp writes, by way of introduction to Charlotte Smith Richardson's poems written on different occasions from 1806, a selection drawn from a whole book of manuscript poems of Richardson's composition. Upon the death of her husband, who was a Unitarian minister, Cap launched her own philanthropic and literary career, working and writing in support of charity schools and editing her husband's and Richardson's works. The title page advertises that these poems were, quote, printed by subscription for the benefit of the author. But in Cap's insistence that she exerted editorial powers for reasons besides generating income for Richardson, is an important acknowledgement that this kind of book did indeed congeal as a recognizable genre with which her readers would be familiar. So today I wanna to talk about these kinds of texts to which Catherine Cap refers, texts that I've termed benevolent publications. Benevolent publications were published to generate income for a charitable cause and explicitly state their charitable intent on title pages and prefaces to entice potential purchasers and readers. The examples I've collected are explicitly printed examples, but this is not to preclude the existence of manuscript examples as well. These publications often use the phrase, quote, published for the benefit of, or quote, printed for the benefit of, and then the name of a specific hospital, such as this example on the screen, which is the Bath General Hospital in this fourth edition of Jane Bowdler's Poems and Essays. These publications can also be addressed to a distressed family or another charitable purpose. And specifically, I want to look at these kinds of publications from the lens of book history. 
the study of book history is interested in accounting for human labor throughout the creation and transmission of a book or text. And there are a lot of agents involved in the book market during the 18th century. It's always been a highly collaborative process. One of the founders of book history as a field, Robert Darton, published this schematic in 1982 in his famous essay, What is the History of Books? to account for the transmission of a book or text. Uh, the text starts here with the author with this little pink highlighted bit who uh, goes back and forth with the publisher who then interfaces with printers, uh, shippers or people distributing the books, uh, the booksellers from which the text can be purchased and then on to the readers. And all of this is subject to economic and social conjuncture. Um, these are the, the little bits in the center that impinges, uh, pressures or otherwise influences the process such as intellectual influence and publicity on this left-hand side over here and uh, political and legal sanctions on the right. But because the profits of benevolent publications are largely directed outside the print trade and into the hands of distressed families, lying in hospitals and other charitable purposes, the financial arrangements uh, between the author or editor and a bookseller or printer disrupt conventional book market relations and redraw the relationship between an author and her poetic um, object. This model, as useful as it is, cannot account for Jane Bowdler and the Bath General Hospital. Further, and I'd argue more importantly, this model doesn't account for all the ways that the author or editor of benevolent publications is invested in the publication process. How in many cases she is interfacing directly with publishers, printers, suppliers, her subscribers, her purchasers, and charitable institutions, not to mention directly with the objects of her benevolence. So today I want to talk about some findings from a much larger project called my dissertation that seeks to investigate this whole life cycle of this phenomenon in the 18th century book market. I don't have all the answers, um, but I've amassed a collection of examples of benevolent publications from searching the English short title catalog, uh, 18th century collections online, uh, multiple searches in WorldCat, and from diving into the online catalogs of individual counties across England. I found uh, great examples in the Marguerite Hicks collection of women's writings at Oakland University. I visited the Library of Congress, the Newberry in Chicago, the British Library, and Chotton House Library. And I've emailed libraries across the country and the UK, begging for quick Xeroxes or snaps from camera phones. And yes, uh, libraries have wrenched 18th century books open and flopped them down on the face of a copy machine and sent me the evidence in grayscale. So there are countless anecdotes, research rabbit holes, and bibliographic discoveries that I could share, uh, but I am <laughs> trying to narrow it down uh, to three specific things that I've discovered so far that I think are important. Uh, number one, women's benevolent publications promise money to a specific recipient. Number two, uh, they are not amateur productions. And three, women's benevolent publications had commercial potential. And hopefully I can demonstrate these three things with some exciting pictures along the way. First, benevolent publications entice their readers with the promise that their purchase will translate into cash benefactions or donations to specific recipients. So it's kind of a two-part thing, promise money to specific recipients. The main phrase I've used in my catalog searches uh, is for the benefit of, and this appears on title pages and in imprint statements, uh, and it brings back a number of false positives. Uh, as a counterpoint, this text that I'm showing on the screen, an inquiry into the nature, order, and government of bees, et cetera, et cetera, from 1774. Its long 18th century title page continues and concludes that this book contains, quote, a secret unknown to past ages now published for the benefit of mankind, end quote. This benefit of mankind promised by this book uses similar language to what I'm after, but with a notable difference. Um, in this context, it's quite clear that the B book intends for the general sharing of knowledge or goodwill within humanity, which is the primary definition and use of benevolence during this time, rather than explicitly money. So you'll often see books of this period published for the benefit of mankind, the benefit of Mr. Kite, no, or the benefit of servants or young ladies. Benevolent publications use a similar grammar in their stated publication rationale, but the meaning is distinct. 
So I wanna show you examples of what I'm talking about. So I'll return uh, to this image that I showed a bit earlier, but do this a bit slower. Uh, this first example is Poems and Essays by Jane Bowdler, which was originally published in Bath in 1786 and would go through about 17 English editions, a few pirated Dublin editions, and a couple American editions through 1839. So on the screen is an image of the title page of the fourth English edition, and I've enlarged the portion of the image that indicates the book was um, published for the benefit of the Bath Journal Hospital. So this text is a bit of an anomaly from the benevolent publications I've found. Um, most, of the to most of the texts are poems totaling 50 pages or less and look a bit more like this. Uh, so the second example is the 1787 poem Messiah by Mary Scott, which also bears the phrase published for the benefit of the General Hospital at Bath. And this is a much smaller, thinner um, pamphlet. Uh, this fascinating 1827 text called Rambles in Waltham Forest, which juxtaposes poetry and lithographic illustrations was a stranger's contribution to the triennial sale for the benefit of the London-based Wanstead Lying In Charity which I found was operated by educational writer, Mrs. Marianne Rundle. Uh, this text is particularly interesting because it's often misattributed in library catalogs and in scholarship to Marguerite Gardner, the Countess of Blessington, but I've been able to trace its authorship instead to a Welsh artist. And uh, there are only 100 copies of this book ever printed. Another example is this 1783 quarto poem, a poem on the love of our neighbor, printed in the city of Cambridge, which was print, published for the benefit of a person in distress, remarkable for her poetic genius. And although I haven't identified the author, uh, I do have uh, <laughs> my suspicions of who it might be. I have traced the remarkable person who was a woman active poet in the 1740s. I notice that this last one is directed to a specific person rather than a um, public philanthropy. And finally, yet another Bath example is this 1815 text, Ellen, a ballad founded on recent fact and other poems by Melusina Trench, which was sold for the benefit of the House of Protection. So when we look a little closer into these publications, uh, the authors and editors give us additional context and specifics about their benevolent objects. And Trench gives us the following information, and I'm reading from the printed bit uh, on your screen. The following ballad relates a story recently given in one of the public prints as a fact. It is published with a few other poems for the benefit of a charity, which may shield more than one from the fate of the unfortunate Ellen. So here Trench is clarifying her use of the phrase for the benefit to mean the sales from this material physical book will be donated to the House of Protection, which was a short-lived charitable institution in the city of Bath for fallen women. And in this particular copy from the St. Louis Public Library, Trench has added these post-print manuscript interventions in her own hand to explain further that Ellen, quote, and now I'm reading the, the manuscript portions, was only saved from being assassinated by her seducer to die in two days after from the shock she discovered or the shock she received on discovering his intentions, end quote. So Trench gives us these additional details to alert her readers that while Ellen might be a pseudonym, um, her readers could rest assured that her circumstances would be based in fact. And the responsible disbursement of charity was of the utmost importance during this period. So these additional details uh, could assure potential purchasers of the efficiency of the philanthropic organization, as well as the reformability of its unfortunates. So women interested in charity at the end of the 18th century were more commonly writing and publishing what Patricia Comatini calls vocational philanthropy, using authors such as Mary Wollstonecraft, Hannah Moore, Mariah Edgeworth, and Dorothy Wordsworth. Comatini demonstrates that vocational philanthropy, quote, gives people texts to read in order to imagine improvement rather than money to improve their social and economic conditions, end quote. Comatini notes that vocational philanthropy is primarily feminine, not because benevolence is essentially feminine, but, quote, because the ideological association of women with these qualities increasingly provided agency for middle and class women to enter a field of public discourse about poverty and the state of English society, end quote. 
that is, this kind of writing was an opportunity for women. Benevolent publications, in contrast, rhetorically treat material disbursement as an equally important, if not the primary aim of print publication. And as we will see, we can often uh, corroborate this through the records of associated charities. Where Comatini's examples show that these women's writings are benevolent in their work to disseminate middle-class politics and ideology to the aspirational classes, my interest is in the texts um, published in print whose materiality and physical dissemination is the foremost aspect of their benevolence. Men, on the other hand, had their own well-established kinds of benevolent publications that operated differently. Male authored benevolent publications were often attached to their professional identities as clergymen, doctors, or surgeons. For example, uh, James McKittrick Adair published his 1786 Medical Cautions for the Consideration of Invalids, those especially who resort to Bath, also for the benefit of the General Hospital at Bath, where he volunteered his services as gentleman surgeon. The title page announces that Adair is MD, member of Royal Medical Society, and fellow of the College of Physicians, Edinburgh. Similarly, this 1786 Sermons of Various Subjects was also published for the benefit of the General Hospital at Bath, um, uses its title page to advertise its author, who is the Reverend Lancelot St. Alban, as Rector of Paracomb, Devon, Vicar of Wimden, Somerset, and one of the governors of the hospital. So men's entrance into benevolent publication is predominantly justified and authorized by their professions, which position these men proximal enough to the poor, ill, and needy to lend credibility to their benevolent projects. With their degrees earned, positions within hospitals, charity, parishes, and associated charities attached to their bylines, their relationship to their benevolent objects is exclusively professional. Uh, and this comes from a long line of um, of similar kinds of publications. The commonest male authored benevolent publication of the 18th century uh, was the Charity Sermon. The Charity Sermon, like this one here on the screen, um, spread across England as an extension of London's Spittle Sermons, which had supported the city's hospitals since the 12th century. Charitable institutions found that an annual sermon featuring a popular clergyman was an effective means of prompting existing subscribers to make good on their yearly contributions and to attract new support. These sermons were often printed following their oral publication, a decision which Donna T. Andrew argues, quote, was probably made because it produced a higher financial return when first delivered and hence the charity hoped it would generate even more funds when printed and circulated, end quote. Because these professions were open exclusively to men during this time, women's benevolent publications were strictly printed, did not have the benefit of being public multimedia events, that is women didn't have the option for public oral delivery. And while they were certainly built on the centuries long tradition of the charity sermon, um, women's benevolent publications were not similarly embedded as part of the social or cultural fabric. This is not to say, however, that women's benevolent publications are not unprofessional or uh, that they are unprofessional or amateur. The authors of benevolent publications actively and necessarily performed a series of tasks that would have required professional expertise, even if some, even if such expertise was not properly professional and that it did not garner a salary or come from the training received from Oxford, Cambridge, or the medical colleges. Uh, men and women leverage their existing identities as successful or money-earning authors for benevolent publications. For example, Charlotte Smith's A Narrative on the Loss of the Catherine, Venus, and Piedmont Transports um, well, it was a series of shipwrecks uh, that occurred in Weymouth on Wednesday, the 18th of November last in 1796 was drawn up from information taken on the spot by Charlotte Smith and produced for the benefit of an unfortunate survivor from one of the wrecks and her infant child. And at the time of its publication, Smith was no amateur, but a well-known and well-established novelist, poet, and children's author. And it was this reputation as a professional author that would have contributed to the marketing and success of a text like this. Even so, women's benevolent publications of this period also include those who leverage neither profession nor previous authorship, but who are represented publicly by the pseudonymous by a lady. 
Jenny Batchelor writes of the multiple reasons authors chose gendered anonymity. Quote, what is striking, however, is how infrequently they are explicitly a sign of the near proverbial modesty or deference with which the practice, when adopted by women in particular, has been traditionally associated, end quote. As scholarship of anonymous and pseudonymous texts has indicated, the reasons for obfuscation is as, or even more likely, a marketing move to entice readership than it is to actually protect authorial identity. The practice of pseudonymous authorship is, at the very least, according to Batchelor, quote, indicative of a widely accepted and vibrant literary culture that actively promoted women's writings, end quote. Women have long adopted and developed innovative generic techniques for entering the market, like the frame narrative, the trope of the found manuscript, apologetic prefaces, and anonymous or pseudonymous authorship. Benevolent publication, too, might be regarded as an innovative strategy for women interested in print publication. But whether the author is known or unknown, uh, stewarded, stewarding any text into publication requires significant knowledge of the print trade. During the late 18th century, there are um, five major publication schemes or ways that a print book could come into the world. While practices varied from publisher to publisher, these are the major recognizable means that we've uncovered from, readings, um, from reading correspondence between authors and booksellers and evidence from surviving publishers, ledgers, and accounts. So I've made a start at organizing these into a table with the names of the different strategy strategies on the left side and some of the kinds of activities publication listed across the top row. For example, who is responsible for providing paper, who distributes the final product, et cetera. So this table is no way complete or comprehensive or maybe at times even correct, but it and it doesn't quite capture the intricacies of when money must be paid or when it will be disbursed. But I wanna highlight one particular element uh, and, and this is this fifth column here that indicates who uh, in each publication strategy will receive profits. And this is important because women who are publishing with the intent of giving the profits to charity would have had to choose a publication method that would enable them to make profits. The most traditional and culturally revered method of publication was this top row, the outright sale of copyright in which the author receives a typically small lump sum at the outset from the publisher, but should not expect further remuneration. So I'm suggesting that this is probably not the means that benevolent, publish benevolent authors chose. It's probably not that, that top row. Unfortunately, surviving publishers, ledgers, and account books are few. These kinds of records have not been kept to the degree that the contemporary researcher would like. Uh, given the evidence I've found from researching my examples, benevolent publications often use one of these two bottom schemes, uh, publication by subscription and self-publication. And with these strategies come greater risk and greater responsibility on the part of the author. The active, these activities constitute the hustle of benevolent publication or the additional authorial labor that exceeded textual composition. So apart from just writing the book or poem or pamphlet or whatever, these women shepherded the text into print and negotiating constellation of decisions um, for format or what, what size, uh, paper types, um, sheets, labor, and as well as capital. Importantly, the authors and editors of benevolent publications also superintended the profits from the bookseller to the charitable destination. So subscription publication was an onerous route in which the author must enlist subscribers or interested purchasers of a not yet published text to help with the initial outlay of capital. As such, subscription publication required one to lean heavily upon one's networks of friends and acquaintances and explicitly ask them for money, very much like the girl from your high school on Facebook who wants you to join her shopping club. This would entail a lot of correspondence back and forth, paying visits and leveraging social connections, all of which constituted a significant amount of emotional labor. And soliciting subscribers was as difficult as finding and managing the volunteer labor required for locating the subscribers. Women authors in particular would have had to rely on male volunteers who could circulate in, male, in public male gendered spaces to come up with the hundreds of subscribers often required for publication. Self-published works, and now moving down to the, the bottom row, uh, required similar labor with additional expertise. The author must negotiate with the printer directly to balance decisions of the type of paper, format, and number of copies, 
as well as the payment for paper and printing services rendered. For example, Charlotte Smith writes in 1794 to publisher William Davis um, about what would become uh, two books, Rural Walks and Rambles Farther. And she writes, quote, I might venture to print it myself, yet as I have not exactly the talents necessary to make bargains with printers and should probably be plagued about it, I had rather agree with Mr. Cadell Jr. and you, meaning she would rather work with them and sell her copyright outright to them. When Smith attempts to oversee the printing of yet another text with printer Richard Crutwell in Bath, she admits defeat again to Davis and Cadell, quote, but I find there are difficulties as to credit for the paper and other things which would tease me, especially if I should be at any distance. I own I should like very much to print it here, but that, all things considered, I had rather sell it, that is sell the copyright to Cadell and Davies and let them take care of the details. In both of these instances, Smith toys with bargaining directly with a printer in order to receive the profits from sales, but ultimately determines that she lacks the technical knowledge. Benevolent poet Mary Morgan, however, had successfully negotiated at least three prints, texts into print already and possessed those talents that Smith declared herself without. In July of 1801, Morgan writes to Philip York, the third Earl of Hardwick, of her interest to inscribe to him a small collection of poems. In February of 1802, however, so the following winter, Morgan indicates a change of plans. And here's an image from the, the manuscript and I'll, I'll read it to you. I take the liberty of acquainting your excellency that I have for the present laid aside my intention of publishing the poems your excellency has done me the honor to allow me to inscribe to you. The price of paper is so very high and the booksellers so very high likewise that till they both come down an author has no chance with them I find. Morgan's stated reasons to Lord Harbick for giving up the venture are terse but telling. Morgan decrying the high price of paper and booksellers indicates, among other things, that Morgan is attempting to print this collection, her fourth publication, on her own account to self-publish it. Morgan has either written or traipsed to multiple printers to solicit estimates for printing labor, and at each would have negotiated formats and paper in the months intervening between her July letter um, seeking Hardwick's blessing and that of the following winter explaining the cessation of the project. In 1823, Joanna Bailey published by subscription this text, a collection of poems, chiefly manuscript and from living authors edited for the benefit of a friend. Bailey wrangled her friends, including several eminent poets such as Barbo and Wood Wordsworth into contributing poetry. In addition, Bailey's colossal subscription list included 36 pages totaling 1,573 printed subscribers which far exceeds the eyebrow raising 1,058 subscribers boasted by Francis Burney's Camilla. Uh, Bailey's preface acknowledges the liberality of her bookseller, printer, and stationer who reduced the expenses of publication to those merely of cost charges. This suggests that Bailey's hard work paid off and that all profits garnered and substantial they must have been went directly to support her school friend, Mrs. Margaret Sterling and Sterling's daughters. So less benevolent publications seem impossible. Uh, they did in fact sell on account of their benevolent purpose. Part of the story I don't have time to tell you today is about the debates, particularly in the 1790s, that raged over who deserves charity and whose responsibility it is to give, as well as the optics and the soci sociability of being seen giving to the right places. The book market too was not unaware of the increasing fashionableness of participating in consumer charity and booksellers leverage this moral and ethical impulse into the rhetoric of their advertising. A 1797 advertisement in the London newspaper, The Oracle, for Samuel Hayes's sermon on different occasions and on practical duties, notes that this text is published for the benefit of the children of the author. Additionally, the newspaper advertisement continues, the subscribers are requested to send for their copies, and it is hoped they will excuse the price being reduced to future purchasers, as it is presumed their subscription proceeded from, note, other motives than merely purchasing a volume of sermons, end quote. The fact of the text's benevolence is presumed the underlying reason that would attract its purchase, rather than it being a bunch of sermons. 
Booksellers at the end of the century selected fewer titles to advertise in newspapers and advertised only sure sellers to lure customers into their shops, where potential purchasers would then be exposed to the rest of the stock. Even so, advertisements for benevolent publications still made the newspapers, suggesting that booksellers saw them as sufficient enticement to the shops. So on the screen, I'm showing the January 3rd, 1788 edition of the Bath Chronicle with an advertisement for the fifth edition of Poems and Essays by the late Miss Boldler, including its benevolent statement published for the benefit of the General Hospital at Bath. So showing that that, that um, benevolent statement is included as part of the advertisement. And if you look in the column uh, immediately to the left of that tiny box is the publicly printed list of benefactions to the Bath Hospital. The Bath Chronicle, printed by Richard Crutwell, who is also the printer of Bodler's off-reprinted book, uh, frequently featured advertisements for new editions and remaindered um, editions that were marketed as new editions of Bodler's book. Benevolent publications are also featured in review periodicals, and the reviews often organize their criticism around the rhetoric of the publication's benevolent purpose. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the literary reviews, such as the monthly review, the critical, and the analytical, are anxious about the literary mer merit of benevolent publications. For example, the 1798 pamphlet, which I don't have up here, um, Mary the Osier Peeler, was published in Whiz Beach, Cambridgeshire, for the benefit of the distressed family described in it. Although an anonymous publication, provincially published outside of the London Center, just small beans, um, and receives treatment in two of the review periodicals. And the monthly review declines to, quote, criticize a poem published with so benevolent an intention, but still excerpts three stanzas of the poem to, quote, show its merit and explain the nature of those distresses which the purchases will assist in relieving. So while I don't have time to say more about that here, it's worth repeating that even though many of these benevolent publications were printed in small towns, in small print runs, they do sometimes make uh, the notice of the national reviews. So we're nearing the end of our kind of whirlwind tour of uh, benevolent publications. We've seen how they don't quite fit the mold for how we traditionally conceive of the transmission of books in the hand press period. We've seen that these publications promise money to specific recipients rather than for mankind or for readers imagined self-improvement. And we've seen some of the expertise required to oversee the whole printing process. And we've seen that these books really did sell. They exist now in libraries because they were printed and successfully sold in the 18th century. But perhaps most rewarding for me are the next few slides where we can see the completion of the life cycle of a couple benevolent publications that is the transfer of the profits to those promised charities. Y'all are gonna be sick of hearing about this book. Uh, so Jane Bodler's Poems and Essays was published posthumously by her sister, Henrietta Maria Bodler, or Mrs. Harriet Bodler, whom you might know was responsible in part for expurgating or Bodlerizing the interesting bits of Shakespeare's plays. Fun fact. You might recall from earlier that I said this text went through 17 English editions. So I'm still working on comparing all 17 of the English editions, but I can say that the type was reset for this text only about 11 times, meaning that the remainders from unsold previous editions were often stuck with new title page that claimed a new edition for marketing appeal. Even so, the surviving minute books for the Bath General Hospital from this period show that Mrs. Harriet Bodler makes good on her promise to purchasers of her sister's work. Here's a page from the minute books that shows a benefaction taken by one of the hospital's governors, John Toke Esquire, and here I'm reading from the manuscript a bit, being part of the profits arising from the sale of the late Miss Boulder's essays printed for the benefit of this hospital. And if you follow the ledger line across the way to the right, you can see that this November 1787 benefaction is in the amount of 145 pounds. If you compare this to the amount of other donations looking kind of up and down the ledger here, you can see that most others are for a pound and a shilling, which is a guinea, two pounds, two shillings, two guineas, etc. So this book is, is generating a lot of income. Mrs. Bowdler makes several such benefactions or discrete lump sum donations as opposed to those neighboring regular subscriptions to the hospital. 
And in fact, uh, from the period of 1787 to 1814, I've been able to trace that the profits from poems and essays brings the hospital uh, 500 pounds. A second uh, neat kind of bow tie example is this end result of this 1798 anonymous poem held only in the Marguerite Hicks collection at OU, Mary the Osier Peeler. And this is the one that the monthly review declined to criticize given that it was published for the benefit of the distressed family in it. So it took some detective work to uncover, but combining what we know of the place of publication, Wisbeach, um, and breadcrumbs in the text of the poem itself, here we see that Mary Morgan, the author, used the money to support one of the poem's characters at the Cambridge Voluntary Hospital, Addenbrooke's. And here, this is from the archives of Addenbrooke's Hospital. We can see in this pink section on the, the bottom right in here that a Mrs. Morgan of Wisbeach gives her 20 pounds. And here again, you can also compare that to what other people were giving, which is usually a guinea or two, and same over in this, these lines. So I've selected some neat and tidy examples to try and explain some of the things that I'm thinking through uh, in this project. But of course, as I've encountered more text, I've had to adjust, tweak, and fine tune my inclusion criteria for what constitutes a benevolent publication. I've learned that benevolent publication isn't necessarily a disinterested publication, and that even if a few quid are sent off to the intended philanthropy, sometimes benevolence is a means of building literary celebrity and community. But if a text serves multiple purposes, does it cease to be benevolent? Does benevolent suggest that authors who keep some or all of the profits are mercenary? Is an author or editor entitled to pocket some of the profits in exchange for the intensive labors of publication? This project regularly makes me question where the self stops and where the unfortunate other begins and what kinds of labor are valued and worth remuneration. What about, uh, for example, this <laughs> fascinating uh, published uh, pam pamphlet published for the benefit of um, a queer partner, but also for the author herself, who was incarcerated. So this particular example is The Life and Memoirs of Miss Robertson of Blackheath, which was self-published in 1802. And you could purchase it directly from the printer, um, but you can also read that it may also be had of the author in the fleet, meaning you can go observe the famous Blackheath swindler, Eliza Robertson, living in the fleet and pick up a souvenir copy. The title page verso also indicates that Miss Robertson respectfully informs the public that every copy of this work is sold for the benefit of her friend and self is signed by them in red ink on the last page. And any bookseller selling them without the signature will be prosecuted for pirating the work. This precaution is taken to prevent a spurious edition and 12 copies or their value will be given to the informer. And sure enough, Here's the signature below the finny in uh, red ink of her partner, Charlotte Sharp. The presence of these various examples I've shared demonstrates that they were written, hustled on the print, purchased, disseminated, and perhaps most miraculously kept by collectors and libraries and cultural heritage institutions. The 15 or so examples I found in the period of 1770 to 1830 or so suggest the existence of a great many others that have not survived because they weren't valued or collected or because they were deaccessioned, weeded, tossed, or pulped. But the evidence and stories I'm finding from these examples in hand demonstrates that benevolent publications were not uncommon in the British book market and that they had the complex financial and social entanglements with philanthropy, uh, literary coteries, authorial labor, and even enslaved labor and profits from it. So, Thank you for uh, hearing a little bit about what I've been researching. Um, I've got, well, I think we've got time for questions and I've also got uh, more pictures if you want to see it too, so. Well, thank you for that, Emily. That was wonderful. And I'm going to open the floor for questions. Do you want to stop sharing so we can go into gallery mode? Got it.
So questions for Emily. Yes, uh, Jordan. Hi, Emily. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Uh, really enjoyed that. It was nice to hear what you've been working on, as you said. I, um, <clears throat> the one of the questions I had, I was, I had a whole plan series of questions, and then you summarily answered it in one fell swoop um, it was somewhere through there. But one question I had was about uh, the sort of materiality of these books. You know, you said you've had some hands on with them. Do they feel different? Or is there any, you know, paper quality, ink quality, any difference that you've been able to discern uh, between them being given their nature? Um, yeah, the, that's a great question, Jordan. Um, anecdotally, yes. And I think that's something that you often find from, or that I've kind of noticed from provincial publishers uh, or publishers that are out, printers that are outside of that main London center. So um, anybody can have a printing press after uh, in the 1700s, we finally got rid of, you know, only a few places can have printing presses so you can have them wherever you want, but still the, the capital, the resources and the know-how still stay in that London center. So when we see publish, uh, Printings that come from places like way out in the sticks in Wisbeach, or um, there's a series of other examples that I didn't show that come from other places. Um, the the technical skill is not quite there sometimes. So oftentimes there'll be lots of mistakes. Um, I think also that lots of these publications would constitute uh, job work. So a, a book can take a whole lot of time to print. It takes a lot of capital. It takes up your entire print shop. Um, it, it holds your your type uh, so that you can't use it for other projects it's a big undertaking but uh these smaller pamphlets um you could roll those suckers out in in no time and that's kind of the main um the mainstay of of a printer um job work would include things like forms and bills and um pamphlets and broadsides and, and smaller work mm -hmm. so there's less time being spent on it um it makes a the print shop less money, you know, in a, but it's quick money. So yeah, I think the printing quality isn't quite as sharp as um, what you see from like the big publishers in London. Um, but that's, that's kind of anecdotal. Uh, but yeah, I've definitely seen sometimes the registration isn't quite there, or um, sometimes the binding is a little like wonky. Sure. Great. Thank that's you. A good question, Jordan. <laughs> uh, Megan. Uh, thank you so much for that talk, Emily. That was fantastic. It was so cool to get to see all of your examples that you've been collecting. And I wouldn't sell yourself short with your anecdotal evidence because as far as I know, you're the only one going around and like holding lots of versions of these kinds of texts um, and noticing that, like taking note. Um, my question has to do with um, comparable profits. So kind of thinking about them, um, how much these texts are selling for? Like, are they, um, how are they stacking up against other more commercially published texts? Are they selling for comparable amounts since we're seeing perhaps differences in production cost and therefore quality? Like how do they stack up with selling um, a text that the publisher has just purchased and is, is selling for a profit? Do you know? This is a great question. I have a slide for that. Um, I'm currently working on trying to figure out that exact question. Because these publications are trying to make money, it seems, uh, do they sell at a higher price point than comparable other texts? So what I have on this, uh, this nightmare that you're seeing on this uh, screen right now is I've gone through one of the reviews, the literary reviews, which are, off, as you know, Megan, in particular, since your research does this kind of work, um, they have a listing of all the things that are published. So it's kind of like a catalog of, hey, this just out, this just came in. Um, so I've gone through the uh, the monthly review, the monthly catalog section, and I've transcribed uh, in this particular instance, all of the listings that are from seven, published in 1788 that are quartos in the poetry section. Um, and have listed the price and then have determined the price in pence uh, per sheet um, and then the corresponding ESTC link. So I can go back and corroborate that. So that ESTC has the extent of the publication, whereas the, the monthly review has the price. So having to cross-check the two. 
But doing this for each of the major years of publications that I have, I can then say, okay, the, the average price, um, and this is not cost, this is price, so how much you're paying. I don't, I don't know about cost, that's, that's, uh, that would be looking into publishers' ledgers and things, but right. I can look at the price for how these are advertised and say, okay, so for 1788, a quarto poem from this year would be about this much uh, per sheet. And then I can compare that to some of the examples that I have I'm anticipating, quite frankly, that it's going to be the same. I really do think it's going to be the same or very comparable, but we don't know. Nobody knows that. So I'm going to find out. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. Think, thanks, Emily. It's um, it's interesting to think about how um, much agency these women are sort of taking on as you called it their hustle, but right, really what that is, is inserting themselves um, with this active agency. So I was especially interested to see how their um, increased agency and action might um, translate in any way to sort of uh, financial element of worth or cost or value. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Kevin. Yeah, hi, thank you. Great. Great presentation, Emily. Fascinating. I have a kind of a related question. Do you know anything about the print runs, the size of the print runs of these benevolent volumes as opposed to, you know, non-benevolent publications? Right. Thanks. That's a great question, Kevin. Um, so I can tell we we know approximate print runs for some kinds of texts. And it's really helpful if you've got those publishers, ledgers, and uh records, which we don't have for a lot of these places. So it's it's kind of yes mm -hmm. work um, for that. Jane Bowdler poems and essays, of course, there's significant because we see her dumping in 500 pounds worth of sales of that text that keeps getting reprinted um, or repackaged and sold over and over again. Uh, but then we also see that Rambles in Waltham Forest that says uh, 100 copies printed. In fact, that was... Um, printed on a label on the front of one of the copies at the Library of Congress. And that would be, I'm guessing that uh, a typical print run for something like this would be 100, 200. That's something that I would love to know more about. Um, but unless somebody talks about it in their letters, and then we decide to keep their letters and transcribe them and publish them so Emily can find them as secondary reference, you know, in a, in a library, um, that evidence isn't there, but I'm guessing given um, the kind of publication they are, where they're published, the quality um, that we're looking at 100, 250 copies, very small sort of thing. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Brendan. Thank you for the talk, Emily, and thank you to, to Wayne for organizing this. It's really great. Uh, Emily, I have a question for you about benevolence. Uh, as you won't be surprised, your talk had me thinking about Live Aid through the whole time and the phenomenon of creating uh, benevolent works of art that are masquerading uh, as actually commercial works of art, right? Uh, and the, the post Live Aid phenomenon of solving world hunger or curing AIDS by releasing records. Um, and being largely ignorant of the long 17th century, when I was listening to you describe uh, these publications, I couldn't help but think whether there were parallels. And you really got right to this question when you closed the talk by talking about the way that uh, these publications are operating as commercial interests, as well as benevolent publications. Uh, and yet the example, the specific examples that you cited, which I thought were fascinating of the donations that these authors or editors are making, actually seem to sell the point that these are in fact, truly benevolent, benevolent publications. These are large donations that these people are making relative to other uh, subscribers of these institutions. And so I'm wondering if somewhere in the mix there, you have, um, messier evidence to suggest that there is something that is perhaps self-interested about these publications in the way that we might say that some of the post live aid uh, records that are purporting to, to cure AIDS are in fact purporting to put roofs over the heads of musicians who are making them. 
Thanks, Bernard. That's that's a great question. And uh, there's some interesting research on on consumer charity and kind of reading that back through the 18th century that I that I am drawing on. And so even in the 18th century, um, there's Sorry, I forget what I was talking about. Um, <laughs> there's, there's still the um, the idea that um, that if you control your spending and you choose wisely what to spend your money on, you will have enough money to spend in charity and um, and they can be in the form of like luxury goods and as these um, in this case publications. Uh, so I think maybe one example would be the Joanna Bailey um, text where she gets together all of her celebrity friends and is like, let's put together a book of poetry for my buddy. Um, and in her correspondence, which I'm very lucky to have because she's an inveterate letter writer. And so her her public, her public correspondence has been collected and, and published. Uh, she writes about her anxiety. She's like, I want to make sure that this is a legitimate book that I'm creating and not just, you know, I'm not literally picking the pockets of my friends is what she, the phrase that she uses. So there, I think there's definitely a lot of anxiety. Uh, benevolence sells. Absolutely. It looks good. It sells. People like it. But there's there are still questions about um, if this is... Uh, a legitimate, I don't know, kind of exchange happening. Um, There's something else I wanted to. Oh, I I have another example of um, of a disinter not necessarily disinterested benevolent publication, and I can uh, show that example just briefly. Uh, I stalled for a moment on this publication, which is Poetical Amusements at a Villa Near Bath. And it's this, it's um, edited by this up and comer uh, who comes to Bath and she wants to be a literary success. And so she invites people to her house on a like biweekly basis for breakfast. They're given these um, uh um, topics to write poetry for in advance. So they have to come and then they have to read the poetry aloud. And uh, the winner must be drawn from this uh, Grecian urn that's sitting there in the on the side. And there's this really lovely, um, hilarious kind of ad uh, admission that she makes here. And this is the, um, within the kind of preface materials of that text. Um, and I'm, I'm reading from this top corner. Uh, the candid reader will please to recollect that he turns over these pages that they were frequently the production of a few days, most of them many hours, that they originated amidst the hurry of balls, plays, public breakfasts, concerts, and the dissipations of a full bath season. Um, so it, it, it's very like, oh, we just threw these together. Um, and then later she says, should the novelty of this publication so far excite curiosity as to encourage a considerable demand for these poems, the charitable and humane will with pleasure reflect that any little profit arising from the sale, the reasonable expenses of printing, et cetera, defrayed, is destined to the assistance of one of the most deserving and importunate um, charitable establishments with which this country is acquainted. So you get the sense that uh, this publication in particular is not interested in really getting money to the bath popper charity. It's predominantly a way of getting um, of getting uh, Lady Miller into the the literary elite of Bath. And I think that's uh, maybe something similar that could be said for more contemporary examples of benevolence or um, kind of uh, good, good works um, done in a public manner. That's exactly what I was asking about. Thank you very much. And I apologize, I'm in my office hours right now, so I have to duck out, but thank you for this. <laughs> thank that's you. Lovely. Um, let's see, we've got, it looks like Pastor Bethany Abbott's got her hand up. My question kind of goes with my, my name. It gives it away and I forget every time I come on Zoom, that's my name. Um, <laughs> so as you're talking about benevolent giving and you were talking, and even just then kind of in the same vein, um, you know, we think about in the church, a lot of times we might have an event, um, to give towards a group or organization, but 
we kind of make clear it's after cost. Um, but an, a way we can get around that a lot of times is we have people donate or sponsor the event. Um, so I just, I wondered if there were, if you come across any publications that were, uh, the publishing costs were covered, they were kind of sponsored by a person, a group, a family, if you come across anything like that. Yes. Uh, I found a, a bit of a later example, but um, in the, the preface, and sometimes these editors are so um, verbose in kind of explaining like, well, this is the situation of how this publication came to be. Um, she, she remarks that she is republishing or reprinting this collection that had been in print for a while, but she couldn't do it because she didn't have the money to start the investment. She didn't have enough the money to cover that initial capital. And so she, in this preface, she mentions that, oh, I mentioned it to my young, well-connected friend. And he's like, oh, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. So because that's made transparent in that one example, I think it's, and that's a great example of kind of a continuation of a, of a patronage system, you know, where you've got somebody uh, who's well connected with money is forking over the money for you to to write and for it to be, you know, use the profits as you wish. So absolutely, I think I'll probably encounter more of those as I keep going. Yeah, I I thought that might be the case, but I'm glad to hear you're finding examples like that. Nothing new. Well, it's it's one twenty nine, so I think maybe that's the end of our Q and A. I don't want to hold people over. Um, there is a question in the chat about the re recording being available. Yes, it will be. Um, and I guess at this moment, I would just like to have us all um, uh, congratulate Emily on a wonderful talk that was full of really interesting information and great details. Excellent research. Thank you, Emily. Thank you all for coming. This was lovely. And we'll look forward to seeing some of you at the next brown bag. Thanks, everybody. Hmm.